You're listening to Advancing Our Church. Welcome to Advancing Our Church, a Changing Our World podcast about Catholic stewardship, leadership, and advancement. And I'm your host, Jim Friend. Welcome back, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I'd like to share with you a few thoughts on a reading from Donald Calloway's book, Consecration to St. Joseph, and it's all about prudence. So what is prudence? In modern times, many people consider it to be a vice or a flaw. In today's society, if a person is cautious or circumspect in moral matters, they're often called a prude. We know that prudence is an extremely important virtue. St. Thomas Aquinas taught that prudence is the principle of all virtues. Its role is to govern the other cardinal virtues like temperance, justice, and fortitude. And without prudence, a person will be either too lenient or too harsh. Prudence serves as a guide, helping us to avoid extremes. Prudence is also a virtue of kings and rulers. And without prudence, no leader can really truly exercise temperance, justice, or fortitude. So why am I talking about prudence? Well, St. Joseph, the father of Jesus, was the most prudent of all men. In every situation in life, he modeled prudence. He prayed and waited on the Lord to reveal the mystery of his wife's pregnancy to him. He educated a God-man. And in every situation, he allowed prudence to govern his actions. Blessed William Joseph Chaminade said that, quote, the prudence of St. Joseph was a supernatural prudence. So supernatural prudence is different from human prudence. Human prudence guides a person to avoid difficulty, suffering, and hardship. But supernatural prudence, on the other hand, does not seek to avoid suffering. Supernatural prudence embraces the cross out of love and always strives for the greater good. By God's grace, St. Joseph's prudence was supernatural and heroic. We know that before the mystery and the complete plan of Jesus' life was revealed, Joseph willingly and voluntarily embraced suffering for the good of others. Again, in this year of St. Joseph, I encourage you to continue to look to him and to learn about this incredible role model of our faith. And now, let's get to work. Today, we welcome Archbishop Paul Blair, the Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Hartford. Archbishop Blair was ordained to the priesthood for the Archdiocese of Detroit on June 26, 1976, and that was following his studies at Sacred Heart Seminary College in Detroit, the North American College in Rome, and the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. He was the Vicar General and Auxiliary Bishop in his home Archdiocese of Detroit, and later Bishop of the Diocese of Toledo. And finally, he's been serving as the head of the Archdiocese of Hartford since December 2013. Today, we talk about his vocation story, his special outreach to young adults in the church, and our work together on the capital campaign with Changing Our World in partnership with the Hartford Bishops Foundation. And so, without further ado, here's our conversation. Well, Archbishop Blair, welcome to the podcast. So glad to have you here on Advancing Our Church. Thank you very much. Happy to be with you. And of course, Fred Roberts, welcome as always. Glad to have you here as my co-host today. Thank you, Jim. Good morning. And good morning again, Archbishop. Good morning. So Archbishop, uh, you know, the exciting news, I'm sure, in the Archdiocese of Hartford is that we saw that you're lifting the dispensation for Catholics from attending Mass and that you're encouraging parishes to kind of get back to full capacity. And um, and that's all beginning next week, May 22nd. So I understand that participants will still be wearing masks, but uh, it must feel good to welcome parishioners back home. Oh, very much so. You know, when the COVID pandemic first struck, um, the bishops of the country really were scrambling to know what to do. And as it turned out, I, I am current chairman of the Divine Worship Committee of the Bishops' Conference. So I had to kind of preside over some of these questions and such. And we did try to provide guidelines for all the bishops, but it was very clear that you couldn't have a national policy. You had to have within certain principles of the good liturgy, you had to, uh, bishops had to respond to the particular situation. Um, you know, whether they could, to the extent to which they had to close down or, 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 or such. And now we're in a similar situation where I noticed various dioceses, various states, 
because of the condition in their particular uh, locale, are able to open up for worship again. The churches in Connecticut never completely closed, uh, as they did, I think, in some places. But we're very happy and pleased that, that for two things. First, that people aren't getting as, as sick with this, you know, that sure. the rate of infection is slowing. And as a result, and the vaccine and the precautions were able to uh, open up again. We're still trying to be cautious. People who are afraid to come legitimately or, you know, who have health issues, uh, you know, we're not demanding that they come back to church by any means. And then things like masks. But even as we speak, uh, the news is coming out from the, the CDC that people who are vaccinated really don't need to wear a mask uh, as much as we have in the past. So we're still playing it a little bit by ear. But I think the mo ma main thing is for people to act responsibly about not only their own health, but the health of their neighbors. Without, without a doubt. Um, and, you know, this has been such, obviously, it, it, it's redundant to say it's been an unprecedented year. Um, but it's been also... I think a time for innovation and a time for uh, pastors and dioceses that we've seen around the country have been innovative in proclaiming the gospel and, and connecting with their parishioners um, in ways that they haven't before. And, and uh, so I, I just wondered, you know, what are some of the ways that you've seen uh, your pastors reach out to the arch, to, to their parishioners in, in the archdiocese that, have, you know, you think or have been particularly uh, notable? Well, certainly live streaming has yeah. been a huge blessing, you know, in this day and age that even though we were so restricted, we have ways of reaching one another. And uh, I think some of our parishes, obviously some were more on the ball than others. That's just the way life is. But some of the parishes, and I would say most of them, uh, have done a really fine job of reaching out to their parishioners. And their parishioners have responded, you know. Um, and then I've seen things, some of our parishes have had parking lot masses and had very creative ways of being able to still distribute communion uh, uh, with these parking lot things. Uh, mm -hmm. So I just think uh, I really give a lot of credit to our priests and people in the parish for, for doing this. All the volunteers that did all the disinfecting and everything, it's, it's been very encouraging. And you know, um, challenges, crises, uh, bring out the best in people as well as some of the worst. And I have to say that I think for the most part with our churches, it's brought out the best. And, uh, and I think what, you know, we bishops in Connecticut have written a, kind of a small pastoral letter about the importance of mass in the Eucharist. And I tend to be one of the optimists about this. I think that getting off the crazy merry-go-round of life and the frenetic modern pace of things has made some people really uh, think. And, and I hope and pray, and I'm confident that they will reappreciate the importance of going to church and the importance of the Holy Eucharist. And we bishops in the country, you know, I'm on that committee as well, are talking about a major uh, plan over the next couple of years of, um, uh, of reinstilling in people, reawakening in people uh, the importance and love for the Holy Eucharist. Well, that certainly is a, a, a reoccurring theme also that we've seen with other dioceses as well. In fact, my home diocese of Allentown, we're celebrating the 60th anniversary and the theme for the anniversary year is a return to the real presence. Um, because obviously, as you say, there's no substitution for being present to Jesus in the Eucharist. And so perhaps it's uh, partly an education piece and partly a time for recollection of the importance in the Eucharist in our own life. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's my great hope. I think God, in a sense, that always happens. You know, sometimes it takes some difficulty and challenge to bring people to their senses. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, obviously the pandemic is a, an evil thing that led to the deaths of many people. Mm -hmm. But it also was a challenge that brought out the best in a lot of people. And we hope that it will be a wake-up call for all of us. Absolutely. And, and you know, um, we, we're also seeing, I think, that many of the advances that we made and, and the ways in which we reached out to people are probably not going to go away. And that's a good thing. Um, 
And I would imagine that that's also true in the Archdiocese of Hartford, that there are ways in which perhaps you've been reaching out to folks through Zoom or through uh, video conferences that will probably continue even beyond coming back to Mass and, and getting back to some semblance of, of normal life. We have, and I must say that one of the things that's very gratifying to me is uh, the outpouring of uh, generosity and charity. You know, that um, I at one point said that what the church needs to be remembered for uh, during a pandemic is charity. I love the phrase of Pope Francis that in the world today, there's uh, spiritual, moral, and material destitution. Uh, and, you know, that we need to address all of these things. And uh, so the charity that we extend uh, in, included, uh, you know, uh, our, our annual appeal, uh, which provides uh, grants to hundreds of local charities. And I was afraid that if they need that, that those funds more than ever. And I was afraid that with the pandemic, we might not succeed. But the annual appeal has actually done very well during the pandemic. And many parishes that have uh, provided opportunities and invitations to their parishioners. Similarly, they've, they've been doing well. Now, we did have some parishes that have suffered and we've tried to reach out and help them. But by and large, it's a, I think that people understand and maybe, you know, getting off the crazy merry-go-round of life and focusing on these needs, uh, people have seen their way to, to be even more generous. And I'm tremendously grateful for that. Absolutely. I mean, the number of par parishes that are now using online giving and the number of parishioners who are contributing now on a weekly basis in that fashion is only going to strengthen uh, the financial viability of our parishes, of our dioceses in so many different ways. I think so. Absolutely. Fred? Yeah, Archbishop, I think it was uh, really uh, wise that uh, in your recommendations that you uh, advise the parishes to continue with the live streaming of masses because, you know, there are going to be uh, some folks that aren't ready to come back right away. So uh, so we're, we're kind of easing folks back in and encouraging them to come back, but uh, to continue on with that live stream, I think will be very helpful. Um, are there any other uh, concerns that you have as folks come back to, to the pews? Well, I would hope that you know, as part of this reappreciation, a renewed appreciation of the sacraments and of the Holy Eucharist, mm -hmm. I think there are elements of Mass that need to be deepened, uh, our manner of participation. You know, here in the Archdiocese of Hartford, we uh, held a synod, um, and the listening sessions and then the final a gathering of the synod delegates from each parish was very, very positive and very helpful. And I have the results of those that uh, those meetings that have yet to be put into focus by me as the archbishop as a way forward for our archdiocese. But it was all brought to an abrupt halt by the pandemic. You know, we couldn't do anything anymore. But I'm one of the things there was the sacramental life of the church and how our divine worship needs to be uh, better uh, conducted, better, more prayerfully and, 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 and uh, uh, even aesthetically uh, celebrated. And I do think that's a big challenge uh, for, for the church that we, that we have to have. I must say in sympathy to our, par our priests and, and parishioners, you know, I often say this, that many of the Protestant churches certainly not all, but I, I believe most of them, they have one major service on a Sunday and may, maybe two, I don't know. But imagine in a parish where you have five masses, four, five, six masses, and for each mass, you not only have to have a priest who's fresh with what he's saying, but you have to have servers, you have to have lectors, you have to have ushers, uh, you have to have all of this, musicians, it's very hard when you are spread that thin uh, to have the same sense of, of high quality, you know, and of, of mm -hmm. what you'd like to do. So I'm hoping that it, uh, people understand that it, it has to do partly with fewer priests and fewer people going to mass. But I think having uh, fewer liturgies where there's still plenty of room for the people to come uh, can actually help to enhance the quality of our worship. 
Well, it certainly will be an exciting time getting getting folks back to, to the Eucharist. So, uh, Archbishop, we wanted to shift gears and, and uh, talk to you about young adult ministry. Um, we uh, know that you're going to be uh, participating in a, a, a conference, Crossroads for Christ. And uh, we see that there's some big names in addition to you that are going to be speaking at the conference. Uh, Chris Stefancic, uh, your Bishop uh, Betancourt and also uh, Bishop Caggiano from the Diocese of Bridgeport. Um, what are your uh, hopes for uh, this conference that's, that's starting next week? Well, Crossroads for Christ is a, a lay initiative, and I've, meant, I've met the, the, the people involved. They're very fine young people who, who want to um, deepen their faith and bring other young Catholics also to, to, to do the same. And there are a lot of those initiatives going on around the country. Uh, I, I think sometimes we can be a bit uh, discouraged uh, when we see the, the great increase of the people who identify as nuns, N-O-N-E-S, you know, that they have no, no religion uh, and, and falling away from the practice of their Catholic faith. We um, American Catholic bishops, um, uh, and I've been on the Evangelization Catechesis Committee of the Bishops' Conference, that committee brought in some really fine um, uh, experts from Notre Dame University and others who have studied this question. And we find that the, the young people who say that, that they don't really have any affiliation, any, you know, religion, they're not anti-religious. 90% of them are not anti-religious, but that they just have fallen away. They don't see the point. They, you know, it's just not important to them. So that's a, that's a positive thing that if we can we can uh, uh, reach them, uh, you know, about the fundamental message. And I think that's so important. Uh, you know, sometimes people get so bogged down with our long history of Catholicism, uh, you know, all kinds of silly things like how many different kinds of monsignors are there and, you know, what year was the Swiss Guard founded? And not, not that those things are not, don't have a, a value. But the fundamental thing is the preaching of what we call the kerygma. What did the apostles go out and preach? You know, they preached the fundamental message of Jesus Christ in the flesh, risen from the dead. And um, I think we have to find ways to get back to that basic uh, understanding that that's the, you know, we're going to celebrate Pentecost in a few days, mm -hmm. that the power of the Holy Spirit to be unleashed to bring people to faith. And I think so many of these movements, you know, whether it's Crossroads for Christ uh, or, or, you know, there are so many other ones as well. Um, I think they're really tapping onto something that, and the something is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we bishops want to be on board with that. And anything I can do to encourage these lay inspired movements uh, that are truly authentic, I think is absolutely essential. That's great. Um, do you have any uh, advice for uh, for us mature adults, how we can help to encourage young people to return to the church? That was a nice way to put it, Fred. I appreciate you saying mature adults. <laughs> well, we all have to be young in heart, don't we? Yes. <laughs> and this, you know, uh, we have to be re re renewed in our youth. I still remember when I was an altar boy in the old liturgy, you know, that you and tutem meam at the prayers at the foot of the altar, you know, that... Uh, about uh, God is rest restoring, giving us the joy of our youth. And uh, so we all have to be young when, it, you know, Jesus says, unless you become like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. I think for, for those of us who are older, and I think of the three of us, I'm clearly the oldest of them all. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's a matter of um, really communicating to young people, uh, the, the what Pope Francis calls the joy of the gospel. You know, that without the, without faith in God, it's no way to live. You know, he gives in in the joy of the gospel in the preamble a description of society today for many people that and and uh, says this is no way for people to live that the joy of the gospel is what refreshes us, gives us hope and life. You know, so many young people today, they are tragically the rate of suicide and, and people who are 
kind of aimless in life. They don't settle down to, to marriage and a family or some other thing. And I just think, you know, that this is part of this, this aimless uh, life without faith. And, and faith in Christ gives you that direction and that vocation and that goal uh, to live. Um, and, and I think all of us, uh, you know, those of us who are older, first of all, we have to show in our own life that it's made that difference. You know, if we're just as aimless and angry and crabby as the rest of the world, that's not going to inspire young people. But I think if we, if we radiate the face and the joy of Christ the, to ourselves and invite young people to do the same and pray for them to do the same, then I think it makes a difference. I would agree, Archbishop. You know, um, I have two young adult daughters and one young adult son on his way. He's a junior in high school. And, you know, what, what I found is just encouraging them to ask questions. Uh, and if I don't know the answer to those questions, it's okay. But maybe together we find those answers together. Uh, and just encouraging the, that dialogue together has helped us help help me to grow in my faith to learn, you know, answers maybe that I didn't fully understand, and and also together kind of grow that conversation and, and the faith hopefully of of our of our children. Well, I think one of the biggest challenges is that when I was a boy, uh, the family, the extended family, the neighborhood, and the parish really were the cradle in which I was raised. Sure, my values, my my life, what I did. And today, parents don't have that, uh, really. It, it, it's gone to the web, uh, to the larger society. Uh, that's, you know, families are all over the place. And, you know, so, so young people are, not, are being formed by a culture yeah. that is not necessarily uh, by any means Catholic or, or, or even uh, sympathetic to what the church believes and teaches about or the gospel about the meaning of life. So this is a huge thing that we, it's just the reality today. And, and we have to do what we can to provide through the church's own communications too. You know, that's so important with social media today that the church has oh, to yeah. be engaged in. Uh, but parents have to, to uh, navigate that wild sea. And it it's is. not an easy thing to do. No. Oh, we can tell you from experience anyone with a phone has a platform, you know, and, yeah. and has an opinion. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it, it does, it does challenge us quite a bit. It's not the same world that we grew up in by any stretch. Yeah. And the devil is a divider, you know, that's yeah. part of the meaning of the word diabolos, uh, mm. the divider. And God knows we see in the, in the society, in the world. And I dare say in the church, all these divisions, you know, two against two and four against four. I mean, it's almost biblical in its proportions uh, of this, uh, this division, often based on falsehoods and all kinds of ideologies that are hugely uh, destructive. And that's where we have to be strong and firm, and we also have to turn to God for help. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The beautiful line from one of the saints that would retreat master said, was it St. Teresa? When you are on the front line holding the cross of Christ with both hands, you have no one but Christ to defend. And, you know, that's a powerful image today, I think. Without a doubt. Um, yeah, it makes sense that we can strengthen our outreach to the young church, that it can only help vocations and ministries also, Archbishop. You know, there was an article in the Catholic New York last month that stated that the Vatican is showing that there's a steady increase in Catholics. And we know that uh, from our own experiences that we're seeing some regional seminaries are experiencing some growth during that pa during this pandemic. What are you uh, experiencing as far as vocations in the Archdiocese of Hartford today? Well, we're certainly not where we want to be by any means. Um, we, we, I'm going to ordain two priests this year. I have no priest to ordain next year. And for a bishop, there's nothing more painful than to have a sure. June go by with no priestly ordinations. So we're just holding our own. On the one hand, though, I tell this to people, and I mean it sincerely and honestly, that, you know, we talk about a clergy shortage. But if you look at the Archdiocese of Hartford, 
we don't have a shortage of priests for the number of people that are practicing their faith. We don't have enough priests to say mass at eight o'clock uh, for 200 people and at 10 o'clock for 300 people in a church that seats 800. No, we don't have enough for that. Uh, so it is proportional. Uh, but having said that, so that I, I guess you'd say the two phenomenon are, are very much inter, intertwined, interrelated. Uh, and when you talk about Catholic growth in the world, you know, I think we're talking principally about mission countries. Uh, mm. Well, I shouldn't even say they're mission anymore. You know, I don't think that Africa, for example, is completely mission by any means, mm. uh, or Asia. Uh, when you talk about countries like ours, you, the people who most clearly and continually identify themselves as Catholic are often recent immigrants, you know, mm. Hispanic, Latino people, although many of them have become evangelical. Um, but, you know, the, the, the question is, and Europe is really a disaster as far as the faith goes, you know, the practice of the faith. I, you know, I know a, a lady who was originally from uh, Germany who said she went back to her home town there and the church is empty. And she said to the priest, where are all the people? He, she said, don't you tell them to come go to mass? He said, I told, I tell him, he said, I told one gentleman and the man said, I pay my church tax. What more do you want? Oh, you know, because in Germany, you have to you take some of your tax money goes to the church. So, you know, when you look at it around the world, um, and, and now New England, is, which used to be so heavily Catholic, is now one of the most secularized parts of the country. I saw they've done sociological studies that Hartford, New Haven, is one of the most secular mentalities on the basis of the surveys they did of people that we find. So our challenge is great. A vocational challenge is great too, but again, we have to we have to put our trust in the Lord and work with what He gives us. Well, what works, Archbishop? You worked in the Archdiocese of Detroit, Toledo, now Hartford. You must have seen a lot of different models in vocational ministry. What have you found, or some of the basic things that work in encouraging vocations? Well, what works? I think what. Uh, I can tell you this now, Toledo would uh, maintain, and I think correctly, that they need more priests too, and they do. Yeah. But I found that a, a lot of those uh, more rural, smaller towns or cities in, in, the, in the diocese where family life was more intact, uh, that they're the places that still produced uh, vocations to the priesthood. Mm. Uh, and I'm not saying that there aren't places like that in the Archdiocese of Hartford, but I think uh, perhaps less so. And um, I, I think, again, family life is key to so much of this. Mm -hmm. You know, we also find that uh, seminarians who apply often come from family situations that are challenging. And they pay a price for this in life, not just seminarians, but all people pay a price for uh, some of these difficulties. And I don't mean to uh, exaggerate it. I'm not saying all of them by any means, but occasionally this mm -hmm. you know, comes to the fore. Um, when you're asking me, what is the answer to this other than a prayer and invitation and, and uh, a, a robust, vocations, outreach to people, uh, young people. I, I don't, I, I, more than that, I really don't know. Mm, that's fair. Archbishop, I wondered if you might share your own vocation story with us. Well, I am, a, I am as a rare as a, a dinosaur <laughs> in as much as I, I always wanted to be a priest. I grew up in Detroit in a very ethnic Catholic neighborhood. I mean, I knew that there was a public school somewhere in the neighborhood, but it never dawned on me that, that there were actually kids who weren't Catholic. I mean, we were surrounded by parishes with huge grade schools. I became an altar boy in the fourth grade. Um, and uh, in those days in our parish, you didn't ask to be an altar boy. The sister knocked on the classroom door and invited you 
out and said they wanted wanted you to be a server. And uh, I I never wanted to be anything but a priest. Imagine that. Uh, and so I went to ninth grade to seminary, Sacred Heart Seminary in Detroit. I went to seminary college. I went to Rome for theology, and here I am. Uh, so that's a totally a different world than than people inhabit today. Um, I think, and I'm not saying that that's the best model, you know, perhaps by having not led such a sheltered life, although I'd hardly call growing up in the 1960s to be sheltered, even in right. the seminary, <laughs> but uh, especially in the seminary with the revolution that was going on left and right. Mm. But, uh, you know, it, I admire the young priests today that we have that have come later in life and with a more mature uh, decision and perhaps a, a better uh, appreciation of the world uh, than 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 I did. You know, I think uh, I think that's that's important. Absolutely, Archbishop. We'd like for our uh, listeners to learn about the Hartford Bishops Foundation, something that's uh, near and dear to my heart and, and yours as well. I know um, I've heard uh, you several times uh, tell the story, um, an interesting backstory about the the history of the name of the Hartford Bishops Foundation. Um, so I was hoping that you could uh, you could share that with our listeners. Sure. Well, you know, having foundations is nothing new in our country. Uh, foundations exist for everything from the local symphony and art museum to uh, groups that help in education or charity or whatever. But to, to have the, you know, the, the archdiocese or any local church, uh, we obviously depend on the, the generosity of our Catholic people. And in the short term, uh, for example, every year, even in the pandemic, we've had a successful annual appeal. And as we say, the money that's collected in that year is spent uh, in that year for the work of the church. But what about the long term? You know, especially today, we where we understand that, at least what I'm I, I'm told is that there there are as a generation of people, including Catholics, who have significant uh, savings, and who are making provision for their future. Uh, you know, when they're not here, what are they going to do with their money? Uh, I also know of, of people, uh, even uh, not just for the future, but now, who, who would be willing to contribute to something more long term. And so that's the kind of foundation that we had in mind in creating the Heart for Bishops Foundation. And in answer to your question, it's not bishop apostrophe S, it's bishops in the plural apostrophe. And it doesn't refer to an ordained bishop of the Catholic Church. It goes back in history to the time when in the city of Hartford, which is the seat of this archdiocese, the uh, major business and community leaders were known as Hartford's bishops. Because when there were major social or economic problems, these people uh, came together and tried to find and successfully found solutions to some of Hartford's big problems. In other words, they were very civic-minded people who, who did this and they kind of earned this somewhat humorous title. They were Hartford, the Hartford's bishops. And uh, I, I, so that was the inspiration for this, that it kind of has a double meaning. It, bishop evokes the life of the church, but it also evokes this history. And the foundation was created under the uh, auspices of the of lay leadership uh, well, actually under the auspices of the archdiocese with uh, a lay board, uh, lay leadership in order to create a foundation fund for the future. And, um, you know, uh, this has led to us having, uh, you know, a, our first capital campaign. Imagine in over 175 years, the Archdiocese of Hartford has never had uh, a capital campaign. And so, uh, this is again under the auspices of the Hartford Bishops Foundation. Fantastic! And uh, changing our world has had the honor to, to work with you on that capital campaign, Forward with Faith, um, a landmark effort. And uh, I don't know how the Archdiocese survived without doing a capital campaign for 175 years, but 
be that as it may, uh, we are um, uh, in the midst of that uh, major landmark initiative uh, to meet the long range, need, long range needs of the church. Um, how would you describe the, the impact that, um, that the foundation and the campaign has been able to make thus far? Well, as, as you know, the, uh, the monies that are raised uh, in a parish, um, half goes to, to the parish for its own capital needs. Uh, and when I say capital, I want to qualify that. I encourage pastors. That doesn't mean bricks and mortar. Or it could. It can mean that. But it doesn't have to mean it. There may be a parish that doesn't have any bricks and mortar. But they may be grousing that they don't have a youth minister anymore. Or they don't have a trained catechist for the kids because they can't afford it. And, and I'm saying, well, that's what your parish should invest its half in. Uh, in order to uh, reach out in faith. There's a lot of things, innovative things that a parish can do with its funds on, to further the faith. Um, and the other half doesn't go to the archdiocese. The other half of what's raised in the parish goes to the foundation and for its long-term uh, goals. Uh, you know, and those goals are parish, uh, vibrant parishes, uh, educational and formation outreach, uh, Catholic charities, um, and also for innovation. I don't think I've forgotten anything, have I, Fred? Those are the, the, the basic areas. Yes. So this money, and this money is not meant that the foundation have, is not meant to be spent right away. It is to build up the foundation so that uh, in the, the, the foundation can continue to make uh, grants uh, to parishes, Catholic charities, schools, uh, any number, uh, and the archdiocese as well, uh, for any number of things that can further the, the work and the mission of the church. Um, so uh, I, I think, this, you know, having to conduct this campaign in the middle of a pandemic has been no easy task. <clears throat> and it continues, but I'm grateful to changing our world for your, your efforts. Well, thank you, Archbishop, and we certainly appreciate your leadership, the, the leadership of the Hartford Bishops Foundation, Jim Smith, the, the board chair, um, has really been um, uh, crucial to, to the success so far, and also to the impact, uh, which, you know, to me is one of the most impressive things, is that uh, we're about to uh, surpass $7 million in grants that's already been uh, dispersed throughout the Archdiocese for those uh, crucial needs. I want to come back to the pandemic, but I know that uh, one of the uh, one of the things that's happening uh, next month is going to be a, a mass and dedication ceremony for the Cathedral West Lawn. So, uh, could you talk a little bit about that project and the dedication? Yes, and since you use the word pandemic, uh, I it reminds me of one final thing about the Hartford Bishops Foundation that I think is very significant. Some of our parishes and schools really were hurting uh, early on in the pandemic. And the Hartford Bishops Foundation leadership rose to the challenge and raised uh, over half a million dollars uh, in emergency funds that all these parishes and schools could apply for grants. And they, they did, and they were given this money. So there's a perfect, for no other reason, it shows how important the Hartford Bishops Foundation and the involvement of its leadership, all these wonderful lay leaders uh, what a difference it makes. If we didn't have that, that half million dollars would never have come to the come to the fore. Mm -hmm. and, and this is meant, as I say, to be ongoing. It's not just during the capital campaign. It's meant as an institution, uh, a permanent one. Now, in answer to your question about the uh, celebration at the end of, of uh, June, one of the um, projects of the capital uh, campaign and the foundation has been some um, major improvements at our cathedral of St. Joseph in Hartford. Um, it, it's not so much about repair as expanding things like the Malta House of Care Medical Center there and the food bank for that section of the city. But it's also about enhancing the cathedral grounds for improved use and the creation there of a mother's garden that will um, obviously be uh, re represent the generosity of many of our donors 
uh, in remembrance of their mothers. And on that day, that garden and that the, those uh, memorials are going to be dedicated. So I, I know you'll join me in praying for good weather on that day. Yes, uh, <laughs> right. I'm told that the design is really quite beautiful. We wanted something that's not going to be so elaborate that, you know, it will cost a lot of money. Although I must say that the don donated services to this from wonderful people is just extraordinary. Uh, and it also will have some plaques that give the history and describe the cathedral. And uh, it's really a, 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 a very nice improvement to that part of, of uh, the city of Hartford. So we're looking forward to that. No doubt, as are we. And uh, we will pray for good weather and, and that, uh, for that mass. And I think very appropriate uh, in this year of St. Joseph that uh, we have a, a special mass at the Cathedral of St. Joseph. Yes, yes. But, you know, sometimes even when the Pope's had Mass outdoors, it rains. So, you know, we, we just have to see whatever God gives. Sure. Well, you know, they say when it rains on a, on a wedding date, that's good luck, right, for the couple? Yes. I, all my years of living and studying and working in Rome, Sposa Bagnata Matrimonio, oh, now what is it? Uh, I can't remember the last word. Fortunata that if the bride gets wet, it's a blessed, fortunate, uh, fortunate uh, marriage. Beautiful. Archbishop, I just wondered in this year of St. Joseph, um, I, I've spent a little time kind of reflecting and praying and reading a little bit more about St. Joseph. And you have, the, of course, the Cathedral of St. Joseph. He, he was such an unsung hero, I think, in the Holy Family. And so many times we, uh, we, we don't focus on him, but I think this year has been a wonderful opportunity for people to recognize the role that he played in the whole in the Holy Family, being the the first one who saved Jesus's life. You know, quite literally. Can you can you offer us a couple of thoughts about about the year of Saint Joseph in the in the Archdiocese? Well, I suppose, in as much as Joseph was our Lord's legal father, and and gave him his name as legal father, we sometimes say foster father. Mm -hmm. But of course, when Jesus referred to his father, it was the fatherhood of God, the first person of the Blessed Trinity. So I suppose in a way, that's why scripture and why revelation accords to Joseph the, the role that, he, that it does. But, uh, you know, there's always been the sense that he was the just man and the righteous man. And of course, that's the highest compliment that you can get in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, to, to have been a righteous and just man. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I think by his, uh, uh, you know, it's a word people don't like to hear nowadays, but the obedience of faith, obedience of faith, mm -hmm. Joseph did what he was commanded to do. And he did it uh, without question, and he did it faithfully and courageously. And so I think that quiet kind of courage and uh, uh, stepping up to the plate, if we can use a modern expression for a man uh, and a father is extremely important. Would that more men uh, stepped up to the plate in our country today to be good fathers yeah. uh, and husbands. Uh, I'm not saying there aren't any, but uh, especially in front of the two of you, I'm not sure. <laughs> but, <laughs> I wouldn't accuse men of that, but you know what I mean. We I need do. much more of that. And we Joseph do. the man. He's the man. So yeah. I think that's what we need. I agree. Uh, it's a wonderful role model for all of us and something, yes. uh, someone for all of us to reflect on. But Archbishop, it's just been a great pleasure to get to know you a little bit today. And, and thank you so much for coming on to Advancing Our Church and sharing some of the great stories that you've had in the Archdiocese of Hartford. As Fred said, it continues to be changing our world's honor and privilege to serve you in this capital campaign and partner with you. And uh, we just look forward to, to continuing that campaign with a great success as we come towards the end. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I enjoyed uh, seeing you and uh, talking to you. Always Happy. a pleasure. Yeah, thank you both. Thank you. Thanks, Archbishop. 
I want to thank Archbishop Blair and Fred Roberts for joining us on this show today. And we'll leave links to the Hartford Bishops Foundation and the Archdiocese of Hartford in our show notes. Once again, thank you, Archbishop Blair, for sharing your vocation story and your wisdom with us. And of course, to see a full video presentation of this podcast, please visit our show's episode page on AdvancingOurChurch.com. Well, that's our show this week. Many thanks to the Changing Our World podcast team and the Pottery Studios for another great show. If you'd like more information about our show, please visit us at AdvancingOurChurch.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Advancing Our Church is a production of Changing Our World, and we are a fundraising and social impact consulting firm that has been advising both nonprofits and corporations for over 21 years. For more information, please visit us at changingourworld.com. Well, that's it for me, everyone. Have a terrific week. Next week, my guest is Father Tom Daly of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia at St. Charles Seminary, and we'll talk about his special outreach using social communications. Until then, take care, have a great week, and God bless.